Hello, and welcome to Sustainable Outlook, a podcast from global law firm k and Gates, where we discuss the transactions, technologies, and trends in the sustainable economy. We hope you enjoy this discussion. Please reach out with suggested topics or guests or questions about how we can work together to create a sustainable economy. Welcome to this episode of Sustainable Outlook. I'm Molly Barker, your host for today's episode and an attorney in the Environmental and Energy Practice Group at Canal Gates. I'm very excited to be joined today by Kristen Martinez, Senior Advisor and former CFO of solar energy company One Energy Renewables and on the board of directors of Wave Energy Company, Asila Power. Kristen has over 30 years of experience in new venture creation and financing, strategic planning, corporate finance, and operations. She led an economic development organization in rural Vermont from 1991 to 1994. She spent the past 20 plus years as founder, CFO, investor, director, and advisor to clean tech, biotech, and renewable energy companies through her venture development company, SoundPoint Ventures. She was an early investor in sustainability through an angel fund that she co-founded in Seattle in 2000. Kristen's energy career first started at Potomac Electric Power, now Pepco Holdings in Washington, D.C., providing corporate financial and strategic planning. She also then led a team that started an unregulated energy services spinoff called Pepco Energy Services. She was the first CFO of Advent Solar, which was sold to Applied Materials in 2009. Kristen has an MBA in finance and investments from the George Washington University and a BS from Boston University. Thanks so much for joining us, Kristen. Thanks for having me, Molly. So to get started, tell me first what brought you to get involved in venture creation and angel investing within the sustainability sphere. Well, I was working for uh, Potomac Electric Power, a large electric utility in D.C., and decided to get my MBA at George Washington University. And I took a class called entrepreneurship. I didn't know what that was. But the class was great. And one of the things that it did is it it introduced me to the startup community in sort of greater Washington. And um, there was a new venture fund being put together called Calvert Social Venture Partners by the the two founders of the Calvert family of mutual funds. They had just sold the mutual fund business to Acacia Life Insurance. So they decided to start their own venture fund. So, you know, through lots of uh, jawboning and going to a lot of uh, night meetings with entrepreneurs, I basically had a chance to do an internship with that venture fund. And it essentially opened my eyes to the entire what was being called at the time socially responsible investing world. So I got to review deals like Whole Foods, first business plan, Bright Horizons, child care, things like that. So that, you know, I was pretty much, I don't know, it got me right away. I had this, I stayed at Pepco to, well, while I finished my um, MBA and then for a period of time after that um, as required. But um, I felt much more at home in the startup world than in the large corporate environment. So what led you then to get involved specifically with Asala Power and One Energy Renewables? Well, there's actually one word. The major word is networking. I moved to Seattle from Washington, D.C. in 1998 because I wanted to start an angel fund that was focused on sustainability. Some of my work in D.C. right before I I moved to Seattle was a couple of colleagues and I started a registered investment advisory focused on mission-related investing. The entrepreneurs in D.C. were like people coming out of AOL and Beltway Bandits and things like that. So there wasn't much talk about socially responsible investing or anything. But mission-related investing was something you could say and people could, you know, have their own mission. And one of the things we did in that firm is we acted as kind of a back office for a national angel group called Investor Circle, where I met several people from Seattle who were rotating out of tech companies in Seattle out in the world looking for different kinds of investment opportunities. And so, you know, we talked a lot and it seemed like there Seattle was ripe for a group like that. Essentially, we met once a month, looked at deals, very much like, um, you know, E8 or other things like that. But the one difference was we actually had a fund of our own to make some initial investments. So when I came to Seattle, besides the folks I already knew, I started networking with the sustainability folks. And there were quite a few, um, Alan Durning, who 
you know, who started what was what's now called Sightline, Alan Atkinson with the city of Seattle's sustainability group, whatever that was. And essentially that led me to become an advisory board member of the net impact chapter at the University of Washington, where I met Bryce Smith, who was one of the co-founders of One Energy. So I actually, you know, it was kind of a kitchen cabinet advisor to Bryce and Bill in the very early days, and then did some consulting work. I was living in New Mexico at the time, so I helped introduce them to some uh, ranchers there who had land that would be, you know, they thought would be appropriate for solar that kind of stuff, so that when the company was looking for a CFO and I had ended things that I'd been doing in New Mexico, that's what got me here again. <laughs> like, hi, <laughs> I'm ready. I can do it. I'm back, right. And then I uh, met Rahul Shandere, the uh, one of the founders of uh, Asila Power, in a very similar way through the sus- greater sustainability community in Seattle. He, was, he had just finished working at Ballard Power Systems up in Vancouver, and his wife was starting uh, medical school at UW. So he and I, you know, worked on a few things together. And then he went to Utah and started a solar power. So long-winded, but that's how it happened. Yeah. Well, it's just a great story that just confirms that networking is sometimes key to getting to where you want to be. So I do have a couple questions for you on both companies. And I'm going to start okay. with Asila first. So for listeners out there, as I mentioned, Usla Power is a wave energy technology company and has made a name for itself from its community scale 100 kilowatt wave energy converter called the Triton C. So Kristen, can you talk a little bit about what makes the Triton C technology so special? Uh, Yes. And actually, the the Triton C is one of three main uh, types of sort of product lines. That's the 100 kW size that uh, the company thinks would be appropriate for small coastal communities. The large, there is a large utility scale, uh, one megawatt unit that's also being developed, and it will first be installed off the coast of India. And then there's also a smaller, a micro Triton. But the, all three use the same basic te- technology, which is uh, the ability to get higher, des- uh, higher efficiency, uh, you know, better energy output. Because the float attaches to the seabed with three different tendons, essentially they're called tendons, but it allows the the float to move in various ways. I think it's six degrees of like pitch. Yes. Okay. You know, not just okay. up and down waves. Every single way that the water is moving, the float can capture that energy. So that's that's very very it's unique and it's also important. It also, because of the way the the floats are built, the materials they're made of, they're not so rigid. Um, some some other uh, competitors out there have, you know, the, the thing is really super rigid. Mm-hmm. Uh, this float can actually sink down in the in, in the event of storms um, to avoid damaging waves because that's, you know, that's obviously a problem at certain times of the year. So the other thing is we have a very simple installation and recovery approach. So you don't need a special vessel to take you out and get you located in the water. So those three things, I mean, that might sound kind of simple, and it is, and often the simple things are the most important. I mean, very clearly, especially the first point you mentioned, I can see how it can make much more productive use of energy because it's Correct. capturing all movement to generate energy. Exactly. Yeah, that's very cool. So Usla Power came into the spotlight in January of 2022 this year after the U.S. Department of Energy selected it for a $1.8 million grant to scale up its wave energy system. Do you see any challenges to deploying this scale-up mode? It's going very well, which is excellent. And, you know, what is going to come out of this is a detailed design for the first uh, commercial system to be sold. And in fact, let me correct myself. The system is pre-permitted to go to the DOE's PAC wave, which is off the Oregon coast. And I think it's operated in association with Oregon State. These are all important steps along the commercialization path. Yeah, that's very interesting. It does make me curious to know if continued climate change and manic climate behavior may create challenges little bit separate from that. What changes to our grid system, if any, do you think will need to be made to ensure the most robust deployment of wave energy possible? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, And this is uh, an instance where differentiating between the Triton and the Triton C is important. 
because the Triton C, the one that's you know in Hawaii right now, the company believes that will be uh, most interesting to small coastal communities so that it would essentially the power would come ashore and it could get plugged into existing you know grid facilities or potentially if you had to enhance do some you know uh, work to enhance or harden the grid just in one location that would be a lot different than you know taking power all the way across a state or something like that so for the Triton C, I mean you could even imagine that a large corporate facility that's located near the coast might decide to buy its power from a Triton C, you know, essentially kind of like a solar or a wind energy use. However, for utility scale projects, you know, it, it will involve um, uh, access to the grid in places like the U.S. and probably Europe. In some places, India being one, uh, there's so much demand for power there, and there is no, there isn't a grid infrastructure already in place, at least not the way it is in the U.S. So. In places like that, that's one reason why we are, we're starting there, because uh, they're very open to this sort of thing, because they really need it, and they have really good waves. That's the other thing. You you know, you do this where, where the wave energy is the best, and there are a handful of places around the world, and those would be the places that, that we'd be going to first. Yeah, that's fascinating. Where do you see then wave energy, you know, going over the next 10 years? I mean, you've touched a little bit from a geographical perspective on India, yeah. but um, beyond that, is there is there anything else you see coming down the pike? You know, entrepreneurs, everything's going to be turned around in three or four years, right? Why, why <laughs> wait for 10 years? No, I'm, I'm kidding. I think probably it will take the next three or four years for uh, for Ocilla to get, you know, um, a handful I don't know if it's how many exactly of uh, these things in the water and in, in different sizes and different places. But, you know, we, we really believe that wave energy is an, an important and until now missing piece of the of the energy puzzle. And it works, you know, it's 24-7, 365, unlike solar or wind. And so those two things or those three things working in, in concert can be much more effective. And wave energy had you know there's a fair amount of money put into wave energy early in this early in the 2000s and many of the technologies were tried and failed and i think lost probably investor interest or you know um, but Asilla just kept working and working and improving the technology and you know figuring things out getting getting prizes getting grants really doing a fabulous job of of r d um not giving up so we think that we're we're very very close to having something that's a, a resource that's very uh, competitive with other renewable power. Yeah, no, that's exciting. I hope it is as successful as we're hoping. So, turning to your work on One Energy, uh, what would you say sets One Energy apart from other renewable energy developers? Well, it's not that One Energy does things that other people don't do in terms of greenfield development and things like that. But I think one of the things that from in my observation, the the company founders created a culture from the beginning of of design, project design excellence, and really, really taking very good care of landowners and, you know, going to lots of meetings and assuring, you know, always working with local contacts. So for example, the first projects One Energy ever developed were in Maryland. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of outreach across the country to work with, you know, local engineers and local local lawyers and things like that. So that I think One Energy developed a, a well-deserved reputation for uh, really coming in and being a respectful developer. And, you know, as solar kind of exploded and lots of people there are some companies that sort of dial for dollars and they do marketing, big marketing campaigns. Um, but it isn't that sort of touch, you know, one customer service, I think, respect, respect for the land, respect for the landowners. And I think that's it's really important. And so that's kind of built in from the start and very smart use of technology, which isn't unusual, but that's it's an important ingredient. And then. Just realizing that, you, you know, you can go find all the great projects in the world, but if you don't have the financial wherewithal to hold on to them because they get more and more expensive, then you have to sell them early 
So sort of went through that whole process, uh, built up the company to the place where it could not only develop projects, but um, have them built and sell them later. And, and now uh, I believe he's starting, in, well, actually starting two years ago, uh, the company built a project that it still owns. So, the, you know, wow. expanding, essentially expanding and growing through the whole life cycle of solar. So, again, it's not that One Energy is the only company to do that, but I think there are there are there are few there are fewer that do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's definitely a few that are involved with every every chapter, and also, you know, it's especially important being cognizant of local communities that are impacted and landowners, as you said. Um, so what would you say is the biggest obstacle or one of the biggest obstacles facing renewable developers like One Energy in the United States right now? For renewables in general, the lack of, I'll say, regulatory and legislative support uh, can be kind of overwhelming at times. You know, I mean, the Build Back Better legislation that was, you know, sent to Congress and basically... <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that contains all kinds of good stuff that would you know help the U.S. meet its climate goals, but without legislative support, I mean maybe some of it will get passed. We hope, but in the meantime, solar companies, re all renewables of all kinds, are trying to develop projects, but buyers don't know what will they really cost and when will they be delivered because the developers can't say. So the other thing is that's really terrible right now in the solar industry is a um, a Department of Commerce investigation into alleged anti-dumping by cell and module manufacturers in Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It was started by a California-based module manufacturer claiming that it was unfair competition. 80% of all the U.S. supply of crystal and silicon modules come from those four places, and in part, I think I just I might be a little bit off on this, but I think those places uh, market share has grown because of uh, tariffs placed on Chinese modules a few years ago. So, you know, this is th this thing has really, really been. Uh, I, I, please don't let it be a death knell, but it's it's definitely slowed things down, and we were already slowed down by COVID. And um, supply chain issues, the cost of transportation, the cost of getting these modules from those countries just skyrocketed. Wow. And, um, you know, it often will hit the, the developer or the builder and not the buyer because the contract is already in place. So it's been a real strain on the industry. And, you know, the Clean, American Clean Power Association has been all over this. They they what their estimate is that about half of the 80 some gigawatts of solar that were that need to be installed this year and next year to stay on track with climate goals are at risk so i mean if you can't build half the projects then or if they get built i mean in hope hopefully this will get resolved the projects will get built the supply chain will untangle itself at some point um you know why not focus some things on developing cell and module manufacturing in the U.S., but that, that takes time, and that definitely takes federal and state support, the kind that some of which would is in the Build Back Better Act or something like that, you know. So, again, these are <laughs> – there. it's kind of a head-scratcher, you know. All these companies are doing what they can to um, reduce carbon and provide lots of, you know um, – solar solar and wind power or solar power and um people who should know better like the u.s chamber of commerce and the business roundtable who both of those organizations lobbied vigorously against build back better so we have these companies that i'm sure are in the u.s chamber and they're touting their esg goals and they're you know talking about how great they are and then through the other door they're um making sure that they, they're they using their money to stop stuff like this from happening. So that's a definitely a thorn in the side of the solar industry. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, it sounds like there's a number of obstacles. Um, yes. It's sad to hear. Well, on the brighter side of the conversation, what would you say has you know been one of One Energy's biggest achievements uh, since its inception? Well, actually, the last question was a perfect lead up to this one because um, – <laughs> 
the challenges uh, the challenges of the solar industry, many of us call the solar coaster. And what I think One Energy's biggest achievement has been is really kind of a, a both and the ability to a survive the solar coaster, but also thrive. You know, and that's taking starting with a small project development shop and turning it into an owner operator is 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 a it's a big ride and there are lots of highs lots of highs and lots of lows lots yes. of stomach clenching and lots of high fives and that's what you do that gives a good window into you know what your life is like as a renewable developer then <laughs> yeah. so like asala that we talked about earlier you know one energy was also recently got in the limelight in the news when Washington State Governor Jay Inslee signed a site certification agreement in December of 2021 that cleared the way for One Energy to build a 80 megawatt solar project called Goose Prairie Solar on 625 acres in Moxie, Washington, which is expected to commence commercial operation uh, by the end of this year. Can you speak to how projects like these positively impact local communities around them? Sure. Um, For Goose Prairie specifically, um, it's estimated that there will be about 300 new jobs uh, during peak construction. And we would expect that about 80 percent, probably at least, would be construction jobs that construction folks hired locally. You know, it's one of the things about solar. It doesn't take a lot of folks. It doesn't take a lot of employees to keep it going like a utility plant does. But the construction is is typically an economic boost. And then once it is operating, I mean, it's a large plant that will provide um, extra tax revenue, property tax revenue for Yakima County. And also this, the the solar leases that, you know, that companies pay landowners. It's a nice, it's a nice bit of cash in a business that's, you know, sometimes really could use some cash. And I think contrary to what I sometimes read in the press, there is a perception by some folks that um, solar takes land out of agriculture, but I don't know very many farmers who would take productive farmland and, you know, lease it out to a solar company. That's just not the way it happens. And, um, you know, if you want to get a solar project done, then you have to work with the, the farmer to figure out where it's not going to impact the farming, but it will produce additional revenue. So that's, I think that's a big thing that's often under undercounted. This project would help Washington meet its goal of 100% clean energy that was set forth in what's called the Clean Energy Transformation Act passed by the state legislature in 2019. And then there will also be battery storage with this project, which helps for things like energy capacity, grid resiliency. It smooths out the renewable energy flowing into the grid. And often, I mean, in these um, you know rural areas, a lot of times the the grid could use some smoothing out and some boosting. So that's a, another thing. Project, the plant um, the plant will generate about 200,000 megawatt hours of carbon-free electricity in the first year. And that's a, enough power to power over 14, close to 15,000 average homes. So, and reduce, you know, emissions. So it's, we think it's a good thing. Two other uh, places I'll just mention, Maryland, where we started, you know, I think we've done nine or 10 projects there. And One Energy was a pioneer in the use of what are called pollinator-friendly plants as ground cover. So, you know, essentially you put the solar project in the ground and then you reseed, but you use all these native pollinator-friendly plants. And so you get all the bees to come back and then that helps the farm. And it's really become a kind of a crucial component of agriculture, you know, helping to maintain or rebuild agricultural ecosystems. Uh, Some people call it agrivoltaics. (laughs) <laughs> um, and then we, we took it a couple of steps farther in with some projects in uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. There were, I think, uh, eight projects in, in a portfolio, and they were essentially designed to integrate very specifically and seamlessly into the various, you know, farms where they were located. So four of the projects have sheep grazing for vegetation management. So instead of pollinator habitat, they got grazing, you know, grazing plants. And then other projects have pollinator habitat. One of the sheep grazing sites is managed by the local 4-H club. And in um, one of the projects has a co-located apiary. So they're planting pollinator habitat to encourage bees to come. And then they have an apiary there as well. So anyway, that's those are the kinds of things that we think are important. 
Yeah, no, that's that's very cool. And it, I think it just goes to show that developers like One Energy are working with the landowners and the landowners do benefit in multiple right. ways and clearly using land that they otherwise wouldn't farm. And if it does need assistance on things, you know, pollinators and other things are being put in place when it's when it's warranted. That's very cool. One, one thing I should say also, <clears throat> Molly, if any of these if any of the things I'm talking about are you know of interest to your listeners, I very much encourage people to go to the websites of both of those companies, oscillapower.com, oneenergyrenewables.com. Uh, One, One Energy has lots of case studies about the projects that it's built, so somebody can get you know an even better idea of what a what they look like when they're finished, and a lot of the details that go into the location and what's been done and things like that. And Asilla has lots of really, really good technical information on, it, on its website, too, for people who, you know, are coming to Wave Energy for the first time or want to learn more about it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for providing that. I think I'm, I'm sure the listeners will want to check those websites out. I'm going to turn now to a couple questions for you about some new ventures you might be involved with. And on that, you know, is there... Any new projects or endeavors you're spending your time on right now? Yes, my longtime colleague and friend Rahul Shendre, that I've mentioned before, who's one of the co-founders of Asilla, recently started a company in the carbon capture and utilization space. Some people say to refer to it as CCU, um, although it can mean in everything from you know vodka that's made with carbon dioxide. I don't exactly know how that works, but. Um, to uh, to things that are seem a little more credible, but um, anyway, this is technology developed at UCLA to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete production, and that's all part of the broader effort to reduce the carbon footprint of the built environment. So you know, people, some people are looking at mobility, transportation. The built environment is a huge generator of carbon. So, and it's a uh, you know. Things like making concrete and making steel, I think some people just think, oh, my gosh, how can we ever change that? But this is one of the ways. And it's again, it's a it's a in some ways a very simple, you know, a simple concept. But uh, the company is called Carbon Built and it finished a Series A financing last year and is now working on its first commercial installation to retrofit an existing concrete production plant with its using carbon dioxide in the curing process. And so that's, you know, it's 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 very interesting. I've enjoyed learning about it and doing a little bit of work with Rahul. And it will be interesting to see how big its footprint becomes because that could be quite exciting. What would you say, you know, makes carbon built technology, which I understand to be the reversa process? Uh, mm-hmm. Such a key invention to kind of dually resolving embodied carbon while, you know, meeting our overarching, you know, carbon reduction goals. Well, I can't answer from a pure technology perspective. So, again, I would I would uh, refer listeners to carbonbuilt.com. There is a fairly good description of the technology. But one of the things that make it a compelling business, from my perspective, is the focus on finding a balance that both produces the carbon reduction benefits but also at a, at a cost reduction to the plant manufacturer, the plant owner. A lot of times, I mean, it's, it's not unusual with new technologies that it would be more expensive to do it right. You know, and I think that's one of the things that has hobbled some of these things. The whole idea of sustainability or clean tech from the beginning is that there was an expectation that, you sure, you can do it, but it will cost more. It will cost more. You, you will make less, whatever. And this this is not that equation. And I think that for me, for me as an investor, that's more, that's actually more important because it means that, you know, it can get rolled out faster. You don't have to convince somebody if, if they're going to make more money. Absolutely. That is kind of the definition of sustainability. It's not, it's not just one thing. It's, it's the whole thing. So, you know, looking at all these three companies, plus the others that you've been involved with in the past, how would you say fi- the financing landscape for sustainability has changed over the course of your career? Um, well, it's changed. It's changed a lot. Um, and I, I guess in some ways, uh, there, there are three kind of three, three things I'll mention. One is what I call the journey from SRI to climate tech. So, you know, as I mentioned back in the, the, the early 90s, uh, socially responsible investing or SRI was the term that people used for these kinds of things. 
that over the next few years turned into what was called being called the double bottom line, uh, which I think was, you know, socially responsible or plus financially successful. And then mission related investing was a term for a while. And some people talked about patient capital and then triple bottom line, uh, which is, I think it, I'm not exactly sure where it was started, but I think it came out of, it's essentially a definition for sustainability, which is, you know, people, planet, and profit, or the three, the three things. It's not just, it isn't just, you know, advancing social goals, and it isn't just making money, but it's also doing it in a sustainable way for the planet, which, you know, many people did know, you know, 20, 30, 50, 60 years ago, um, just didn't do too much about it. Um, but again, it was hobbled by this sense that it wasn't quite, not quite ready for prime time investing, you know, not quite ready for people that just wanted, who wanted to make money. So uh, a couple of guys, Nick Parker, branded this area called, and called it clean tech back in, you know, 2000, again, the early 2000s, maybe 2003, 2004. And uh, in the year 2006, there was 1.5 billion in venture investments made in clean tech. Um, and I think a lot of that happened because the first, well, probably one of the first waves of IT or internet entrepreneurs looking to do something more than make money started, you know, showing up at these things and taking leadership roles, uh, starting their own companies, acting as angel investors, people like Reed Hoffman, Mark Pincus, um, Sunil Paul. And that, you know, that really, that made a big difference. But again, there was there's a learning curve there because people coming to things like the like energy, the energy world or construction or something like that. They come if you come from a world of the Internet or an, you just built an app and sold it for two hundred million dollars. That doesn't happen in, in these industries. And a lot of the, the uh, R&D still had to be done. So I think, you know, the period from probably about 2000 maybe 2009 till recently was a bit more of a slog for folks. But most recently, the, the term that has the buzz, as far as I can tell, is climate tech. And, you know, everybody puts their own spin on it. But something like Bloomberg says that in 2021, there was $750 billion uh, spent globally on clean technology. Now, those, that's the buyers. On the investment side, the uh, 1.5 billion in venture money from 2006 grew to 32 billion, and um, then there was an additional 25 billion in private equity. So there's still a lot more money that's going to be needed, but there are more and more um, investors interested and committed. Um, you know, I just had coffee earlier this week with a woman who's, you know, wants to move from um, uh, the you know internet world into renewable energy. And the week before that, somebody sent me their nephew's resume because he wants to get out of aeronautics engineering and, um, you know, be in renewable energy. So, um, you know, I think that with any luck, we'll keep the momentum going. Um, yep. The two other things that I want to mention is uh, I think greener public procurement is can completely have an effect. So, you know, uh, California is saying they want to make sure that there are uh, electric car charging stations all over and, and making things like permitting for that easy and maybe some, you know, essentially creating market pull for some of these technologies. Again, back to the Build Back Better or something, some sort of, you know, federal legislative support for, you know, the money the government's going to spend, spend it on things that can you know do two things? Don't just you know keep doing the same thing. I think that's the definition of, of crazy, right? <laughs> and then the last thing is something kind of exciting happened last week. You probably heard about it. Um, the the Frontier Fund was announced. Um, it nine hundred twenty five million dollars, almost a billion dollars, from Stripe, Shopify, Alphabet, Meta, McKinsey, essentially taking a strategy that's been successfully used in the vaccine development world forever um, and use, applying it to carbon. So what they're doing is so they're both buying offsets uh, in um, from more mature companies. So they, you know, but also what they're calling advanced market commitments. So basically telling, they tell companies that are 
in the earlier stages or has or have a technology that is not quite as developed, you know, okay, if you guys, this is a promise, you can take it to the bank. If you create these carbon, um, if you, um, you know, get, get, get rid of this much carbon, we will pay you, you, you do X, we'll pay you Y. And then the company can use that commitment, should be able to, I think, to say, go out and get uh, debt financing to build some of these things, because you can't do it all with, with private equity. I mean, it doesn't make sense. We have, you know, we have lots of people who do project financing for all, for many other industries. But if you're, you know, putting in the first few plants with new technology, even if it's demonstrated, it's going to be hard. And you're a startup. It's going to be very hard to get that kind of financing. So I think it's a, I think it's just a really, really smart thing to do. And, you know, they're, they're I mean, offsets can be problematic. So one thing you want to know for sure is the, the process they're using to verify the offsets, to define and verify. It seems really solid. The other thing is that, you know, a company like any of those companies, Stripe, Shopify, they can, um, there are some things they can do in their own processes potentially to reduce emissions, but they're, you know, they're still going to have to get on airplanes and they'll still be, there There will be things for which an, an offset is a very good idea still. So, but targeting it to the, the you know, the car, the companies that are actually doing something about carbon, I think is really brilliant. So keep your eye on that one. Yeah, that sounds, and it sounds very cool that, you know, these companies are coming together to create more momentum and a bigger force. Is yeah, exactly. Very amazing. So I guess my, my last question for you is, you know, through your experience in venture creation at Soundpoint Ventures, what's the biggest takeaway you've learned about assessing the viability of a, of a sustainability startup? Oh, well, I would say, I'd have to say that for me, the gold standard is the triple bottom line. If you haven't figured out the people part, if you're not, you know, doing it the right way, if you're not, if you don't create a culture where people want to come to work every day and all that kind of good stuff, and you engage with your stakeholders, all kinds of stakeholders, and you aren't doing something that, well, at least don't hurt the planet. If you're, if you're not actively helping it, at least don't hurt it and help it along the way everywhere you can. And you need to make money because it, it takes money to do those things. And probably there were some days when, you know, with a very wide-eyed and excited and um, optimistic uh, person sort of looking at all these great, you know, business plans and wow, won't, won't that be wonderful when that happens? But yeah, it has to be a business because that's what it is. It's a business. Otherwise, it's a nonprofit. And that's an, that's an important part of the economy. That's just not what, what a startup should be. So and that can be that's 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 a hard thing for some of the entrepreneurs to, you know, to uh, to deal with as well. But if you can do those when when you do those three things, to me, that's when you've you've made a success of it. Very cool. Well, you know, your insight is very interesting to hear. Um, so, you know, thank you, Kristen. And thank you to those of you who are listening to this episode of Sustainable Outlook. We hope you enjoyed this session and we hope that you will join us again soon as we continue to explore this intersection of environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainable Outlook. To listen to past episodes and receive notices for new episodes, subscribe by searching Hub Talks, that's H-U-B Talks, in your favorite podcast app. We hope you will tune in next time to learn more about the outlook of the burgeoning sustainable economy.